Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I think the nice thing about this, or the, the nasty thing, is that pretty much everything I'm about to say has already been said, which is at least it sort of confirms to me that maybe I'm doing the right thing. But um, I'm going to talk about um, operative technique for a fi a fixator assisted nailing for deformity correction. Um, the focus is really going to be on operative technique. It's my experience, and as, as Hemant said, it's my technique and it, it's general principles. But I'm very much going to illustrate what I do with a case. So I'll run through a case and, and show you what I did and why. Um, I've got a couple of further case examples, which are much briefer if we've got time. But if we don't get to them, it's not, it's not a problem. There is no science in my talk. Uh, there is no evidence. It's just my anecdote and what I've been taught by my um, educators over the years. <clears throat> there are some applied mathematics, but you've already learned the mathematics that go with it, I think, as this was the course. So we'll start with the case. This um, is a patient that was referred to me a couple of years ago when, um, well, you'll see why in a minute. But she'd had a um, very, very difficult time as a young uh, lady in her sort of late teenage years. She'd had a very uh, horrific road traffic accident, multiply injured. She's got a sciatic nerve injury actually on the other side than the one in question. She's got bilateral femoral fractures. She had burns on one side. So she had a really, really tough time of things. And she was now in her sort of early 30s. And um, she'd had this injury in her femur on the right-hand side. And the, one of the surgeons who'd been caring for her in a, in a unit nearby to us decided for reasons that are not quite clear still to remove this femoral nail. Um, she thinks it related to um, concerns that she might need a hip replacement in later life. But anyway, it, it wasn't really clear why it happened. And unfortunately, during that procedure, this happened. So it, they had a somewhat bad day at the office. Again, I've not quite got to the bottom of how that happened. I think they maybe didn't remove one of the locking bolts when they were trying to remove the nail. But for whatever reason, she suffered this sort of comminuted distal femoral fracture intraoperatively, and it was stabilised with a short retrograde femoral nail on the table before they woke her up. To do so seems reasonable. I'm not sure it's an implant I would have chosen for that. Um, and following this, she was kept in bed for quite some time. But despite that, this was the outcome. Yeah, so you can see it's, the fixation has failed. There's loss of, gross loss of position of this fragment, tilting the fragment into valgus, yeah. And this is where she was left. So she was referred to me at this point. Um, these are a standing alignment views. And we have some clinical photographs that she's, um, she's aware we're using. She provided the pictures. Um, so she's got pretty significant valgus. And we'll come on to look at that in more detail in a minute. She had knee pain. She's got leg pain. At this point, she had a non-union, I think, at that level. But her um, operative management was somewhat delayed due to her becoming pregnant and not wanting surgery while she was carrying a child, and then COVID. So actually, you'll see that by the time we treated her, it had actually partially united. Um, so this is where we started from. So I'm going to run through some of the principles of, I'm not going to really talk about why we selected various implants and so on and so forth. I'm really going to talk about the principles of the surgery and, and what we did. The first thing I'd say is I think the most important thing um, when using, when correcting any deformity, but particularly when one is using internal fixation, is to do all of the things that we've learned in the course this week. And so it's, it's absolutely critical to define the deformity. And I would say that deformity planning is it's probably just as important, but I would say it's probably even more important when using internal fixation. I have to say, one could, if you're of this mindset, come into theatre, put a hexapod on without checking the deformity and probably correct it. I wouldn't recommend it because you'll miss deformities and you may create um, unintended problems for the patient. But you can't do that when you're using internal fixation. You have to have, a, in my mind, a very clear plan of what you're going to do at each step. So I'll go ahead and talk about this. So here is something that hopefully you'll be familiar with. So we define the deformity for the patient. Hopefully they're projecting. And then we do our standard deformity planning, as you've learned. This reveals a deformity in her distal femur. And then we move on and look at that in more detail. So I won't bore you with talking about how to draw the lines, because hopefully you've seen that. So we looked, we felt there was probably a um, significant 
deformity in her distal femur with the cora just proximal to the new fracture. Measured 17 degrees. But actually, at that point, we noted she's got a pre-existing deformity at a slightly more proximal level from her original injury. And so I think deformity is probably better uh, characterized by a third line. And you should hopefully be familiar with those things from what we've done. So we think that probably is a reasonable estimation of the deformity for this patient. Yeah. Any, everybody happy with that? Yeah. So we've done that lots of times already, haven't we, this week? So just as you would with a correction using an external fixator, but again, I think there's, a, there's more nuance and detail perhaps to it when you're going to use internal fixation. So you go on and plan very carefully how we're going to do the correction and how we're going to stabilize the, the corticotomy when we've done it. So you see here I've used some deformity planning software to define the deformity and planned a correction. So this was actually slightly cheekily probably using the hex ray software, which is very good. Um, we had no intention of ever putting a hex pod on it, but it, it, you know, it's the same technique. You could use Bone Ninja. Some of my colleagues use a graphics package, but I, I prefer something that will actually allow you to draw the lines. It's designed for that method. But you can see this is the correction that um, was defined by the software with the planning that I had done. The, pink line which I've added, which you can see here, is actually a mechanical axis that it's just cut the bottom of her foot off on the screen that I grabbed it from. I didn't have a big enough screen on my laptop that it would let me show the whole thing while I captured it. And of course, it's important to remember, it's a three-dimensional structure. So think about the effect that this will have in both planes or actually in three dimensions. So this is where I felt her correction should be to correct her axis looking at the deformity as I had defined it. One thing that was important at this point was that um, we discussed this at some length and she was really keen to avoid an external fixator. And we were planning to manage this using an instrument delivery device. And we've actually, I don't really, if I don't have to, want to break the bone in two places. And so what we've done is we've defined an a single osteotomy at that original resolution cora, but we'll come back to that. So that may have implications for how we can manage things later if we're going to use internal fixation. It has less implications if we were going to manage this with external fixation. But we haven't forgotten about the second level of deformity, but that's why we've planned it with a single osteotomy here. Okay. So it's important to go on and plan the fixation, think about how we're going to stabilize the um, bone once we've corrected the um, deformity. And we need to think really carefully about how those implants are going to work, not only um, in terms of them biomechanics, as we've heard a lot about already, but also about how you're actually going to get them into the bone, if that makes sense, and get them to sit in the correct place, and what effect they may have on the operation that you're doing. So here we can see again, come back to the plan that you've already seen. And I'd like to put an intermodulary device retrograde from the knee I'd like to put a long device in. I don't want to put a short nail in because of the problem she's already faced. But this, you can see, may well cause us a problem. So we can already see that probably partially because of the translation and partially because of that second deformity, it may be that we can't introduce the nail. So that, that was something we were very aware of. I played around with the software a little bit, and by translating the osteotomy a little bit laterally, I thought there was a possibility that we'd be able to introduce the nail and get an acceptable position. And when we replanned and redrew a mechanical axis with that slightly, it will result in a slight undercorrection, it still appeared reasonable. It's important to note she does ha actually have some valgus on the other side from her other injury. And I also was keen to avoid creating a sort of windswept appearance. So I wasn't too worried if I undercorrected her a little bit at this point. We do have to be mindful, though, that in theatre, if we can't achieve the correction that we wish and treat this through a single corticotomy with an intermodulary device, and she'd been warned of this, we may have to do a second osteotomy somewhere around the other level of deformity to accommodate the passage of the nail. Yeah? Make sense? And, of course, we're thinking about it in more than one plane. Yeah? <laughs> 
So I didn't really foresee any particular problems in the sagittal plane. I think when I'm selecting implants for these sorts of procedures, it's, it's really important to consider their stability. When you're correcting deformities with implants, as um, the previous speakers have already said, you're asking bigger questions or different questions of those implants, really, than what they were probably designed for, which is fracture fixation. There are likely to be large deforming forces on the uh, bone when you correct the deformity acutely, particularly in uh, chronic or, or um, a sort of congenital conditions rather than an acute correction. It may also be, particularly if you're using a nail, that your fixation is less stable than usual. So if you think about our current situation, there is already a retrograde femoral nail in place, and that device will have damaged the bone. And when we remove that device, it will leave holes in the bone that wouldn't be there if you were nailing a fresh fracture. And that in itself will create instability to your construct. And it's very important to consider that. So I think you should try and select wherever you can if you're using a nail, implants with multiple uh, locking options. And some of these, we, we've had a device that's angle stable at the distal portion so that you can put angle stable locking screws in, which just, whether it makes a difference or not, I couldn't really tell you. But anecdotally, it reassures me that this um, implant and construct, the final position is less likely to be lost. And it gives you more confidence in getting the patient to weight bear earlier. Also have to really think hard about using adjuncts. And I'm gonna talk briefly about polar blocking screws, which you hopefully will have familiarity with already. But also you may wish to consider additional fixation for the reasons we've already said, rather than just lying on the, relying on the lock nail. Polar blocking screws. So here, if we've got a nailed tibial fracture, you can imagine that that may lose position, particularly where it's away from the diaphysis into valgus. The bone has shifted thus. If we move it back, you put in the blocking screws where you don't want the nail to lie. And that's the way I think about it. Does that make sense? So schematically, if you have a bone in cross section and, it, and the bone can drift across the nail on the locking bolts, what you've done is this, isn't it? And it blocks the, uh, the fixation moving. Here's a very quick example of something I did in clinical practice. Blocking screws top and bottom. So the other thing that we planned with this case is probably a blocking screw, maybe even an additional plate. Finally, think about how we're going to achieve and maintain the correction. We've seen this done yesterday, so our plan was to put a monolateral um, rail type fixator on. You notice that I've put the pins parallel to the joint rather than at 10 degrees. I'll show you how I was going to accommodate that later. We talked about that in some detail yesterday, but actually it depends how you're going to line the, the pins up on the frame. And then we've planned to correct that. And you can see that that plan looks quite like the plan which we had from our original deformity planning software, yeah? So only at that point do I come on to the operation. <laughs> so here we can see this is the young lady's leg. She's prepped and draped on the table, radial loosened table, plan up on the wall, exactly as uh, people have said. I think it's really important you write the steps down. It's easy to forget things. This is us selecting the entry points for our um, uh, pins for the correction to lay out with the path of the um, new device we're going to put in, we actually chose to lose, leave the nail in place while we did this so that we knew that uh, we would leave a space for the trajectory of the new implant. Here you can see we've put those um, fixator pins in that will afford our correction. And here you can see the leg, clinical photograph of the leg. We've actually uh, at this point removed the um, device, hence the incision on the knee. Yeah. Here you can see what we've used here is a rotation block. So that actually lies at 10 degrees to the axis, which we will apply. I, I do this simply because I find it easier to put a pin in parallel to the joint than at 10 degrees. It saves me having to put a what marker wire in. You can do it either way. Performed our corticotomy. It had united medially, partially united. And there you can see our correction. So we've applied the... Um, the two blocks of fixation onto the rail. And you can see that that's lying at that 10 degrees to give you a, hopefully, correction into the anatomic axis, yeah? And then, as uh, Hermann said before me, check your alignment. So here you can see we've used a diathermy cable, placed it on the hip, placed it at the center of the ankle, 
checking it's passing roughly through the center of the knee where we would wish our correction to be. We've, we've applied a little bit of translation on those pins as we've planned. Looks to be acceptable to our preoperative plan. Here we're looking, again, this is a slightly different thing. I'm running the wire along the anatomic axis to see whether I think I'm going to be able to put the, the retrograde femoral nail in as planned or whether we may have to do the second course cotomy. But I was pretty hopeful at this stage that actually this looked like it would accommodate a straight rod. Polar blocking screw being placed as planned. Guide wire has been passed beyond the, um, and we were quite pleased it did pass beyond. We quite carefully placed those shan screws, but it's, it's more difficult to tell at the proximal end. It's more difficult to get a lateral radiograph, but it passed fairly easily beyond there. But we were a bit concerned when we passed the large reamers up that they may clash with the pins, and so we backed them out so they became unicortical at that point, and it retained sufficient stability. Here we complete the fixation. I've actually, because it was quite a large opening wedge, don't really know if this is necessary. Because I, I'm concerned when we've got a big open approach like this, you won't get the autograph from the reamings. I've done a couple of these now where I've used a rear um, reamer simply to, to ream for the nail, but then you collect the graft and place it manually into the gap. So we've done that. So you can see the hazy blob of bone healing magic in the gap there. And as again, as we said, we've checked that fixation. It's maybe slightly lateralized from the actual mechanical axis, but we were fairly happy with that. We'll just come on to the post operative. So these are the photographs. She actually sent me these because it's a relatively recent um, procedure. See, she's delighted with the outcome. I beat myself up slightly that it wasn't quite as good as I wanted it to be, but she's very pleased. Um, she's only recently post op so I can't tell you whether it's going to go on and heal. I'll tell you next time. <laughs> and you can see that our final result is very similar to the operation which we planned. So just to summarize those points, these are very generic um, messages to take away. Deformity assessment is absolutely critical in any of these cases, particularly when you're using internal fixation. Plan your correction, but also plan your fixation Consider the stability of whatever construct you're going to use and consider that the demands placed upon it are likely to be greater than those or different to those in fracture management. Plan how you're going to achieve and hold the reduction. There's lots of different ways to do that. You've seen it done with a hexapod. You've seen it done with a hinge. I really like using these rails for the distal femoral fractures, particularly if you're going to use a nail. I think they really work really, really well. But there's lots and lots of different ways to do it. And then execute the plan. And I think... I think it was Liz that said it. It's so important to have the plan in theatre and have the pictures up in theatre. And I write a list on the wall of the steps because it's really easy to forget something or miss something, forget to break the fibula and you're doing it inside the frame, forget to do some part of the operation and go back and check at each stage because there's lots and lots and lots of steps to it, particularly under the pressure of other things going on. It's very easy to miss them. Um, that is time, so I can stop there. <laughs>